I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland as and we go directly you, to our host. Thank you, Wayne McFarland. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along. And Wayne, I thank you for the musical introduction and interlude. I was telling my guests today that you and I have this uh, history of feeling uh, the universe and Always translating and, forth, say and a communicating. Word, I can sing that word. Right, right. And so that's why it's so much fun. I open this show normally in the radio version of it on KFAI with Wayne's music. He has a song now called um, The World, World is, now. is Now. And the meaning, the lyric, the passion of that song uh, delivers a sense of immediacy in your thought. He Urgency. reminds us that this moment is the moment that counts. And so with that, I'm so glad to have you here today on this program. Uh, Dr. Retha Clark King is uh, an elder, a luminary, uh, a wonderful spirit, just a great person in our community. She served as a vice president at General Mills and she actually was the president of General Mills Foundation from November of 1988 through May of 2002. I met her first though when she was the president of Metropolitan State University. And I'll tell this story, because uh, Atum and I talked about it. Uh, Atum Azahir, uh, let me introduce her first, is the chief executive officer and the chief compliance officer. She's the founder and elder consultant in African Ways of Knowing at the Cultural Wellness Center. Uh, the Cultural Wellness Center creates a space and a process for people to privately study and know their own culture, to hold internal dialogues, to practice ritual and ceremony, and to come together with people from other cultures to learn from each other uh, and to celebrate work, learning, creating unified community. Worthy missions. Wow. And so, <laughs> so. Yeah. This conversation is about that, uh, your work, uh, both of you working in these fields. Uh, Dr. King, uh, I studied at the uh, University of Minnesota School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I was a Carl Rowan scholar, but you introduced me to Carl Rowan, yeah. and he was here as your guest. That's and right. so you brought one of the icons of my intent and my desire uh, into focus for me. Right. And so I, I thank you for that today. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Let me ask you to talk about your career. You've got a great story. You talk about your beginnings in Georgia. Yes. Uh, talk about your beginnings in Georgia. Well, thank you. So, thank you for the opportunity, Al. I can now talk about those beginnings and smile. As you know, uh, there was a time when I could talk about those uh, beginnings and feel lots of pain. Uh, I, I can use many words to describe them. Uh, probably the best summary is very humble beginnings. Uh, and um, I'm proud to be able to use that word, humble, because um, 
it, it, you think of your ancestors uh, with uh, lots of gratitude. Uh, I grew up in a sharecropping family, uh, like uh, so many of, of black families did, in South Georgia at um, a time when uh, there were no opportunities for us blacks. As a matter of fact, so many obstacles were uh, thrown in our path that uh, we didn't think the outside community, particularly the white community, felt that we deserved any opportunity. And that was the sad part. You were told and treated in a such a way that uh, others who held the power and the control were saying to you, you don't deserve opportunity. And I, But because of the encouragement of my family, and mainly their encouragement was to work hard, get an education, and then share with the rest of the family. Uh, those are good virtues to have. So my, my two sisters and I uh, took their message, their encouragement seriously, and uh, picked as much cotton as we could. You actually to picked earn, cotton. You picked cotton. <laughs> earn as much money as we could uh, and to help my, our single mom mm -hmm. and uh, to help our, um, help our parents, mm -hmm. our families. Mm -hmm and then to be able to go to college, to go to school. But that encouragement to get an education, get an education, use your brain. And remember, you gotta be better than white people. <laughs> you gotta be better than they are uh, in order uh, for them to, um, for, for you to be able to succeed. Uh, don't be just good enough, but be your best. Uh, that was a great message, great encouragement. So. I started first grade at, uh, when I was four years old uh, in our rural church, in our uh, community church. It was the uh, school by day, a weekday, and uh, we, we worshiped there on Sunday, and uh, there was uh, uh, one evening of prayer meeting. Uh, and uh, what did we young children look forward to? That dinner on the ground after church on Sunday. That was your best meal of the week, you know. <laughs> so. Um, but then I, 1954, I was very lucky to get a scholarship to Clark College at the time. Now you know it's Clark Atlanta University. And uh, on the trailway bus, uh, left South Georgia, Moultrie, Georgia, September 1954, seated on the back of the bus, which was where we were supposed to sit. Required. Uh, required to sit, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, went on to Atlanta, at, traveled that 200 and about 25 miles, and um, I never looked back. Um, I, I knew by then that I would have to get an education and go north. You know, we blacks were aiming to go up north uh, so that we could uh, get better opportunities and be treated better. So I went on, uh, had a, got a wonderful education at uh, Clark, uh, majored in chemistry, and uh, held that decision a secret until uh, my junior year. For, I was supposed to major in home economics, which was the appropriate uh, major for girls. <laughs> I used to, uh, to be a home economics teacher, go back and teach at the local high school. But uh, my chemistry professor convinced me to go to, uh, that I could make it, I could be a research chemist. I learned about George Washington Carver during Black History Week. He said, you can be a research chemist, just study, but you're gonna to have to get a graduate degree, a doctorate degree. You're gonna to have to go get higher, more higher education. And so I made that decision and shared it with my sister who was at Dillard University at the time. And then I finally broke this mess, uh, news to my family, my mom, and maybe unfortunately with her younger sister too, because right away she said, you won't be able to find a husband if you get more education than he has. <laughs> so uh, her name was Loretha, and she was, I thought she was low down. <laughs> but, but my mother supported that decision, and particularly my older sister, because uh, she made a decision that now I get passionate about. She joined the Army, the Army Nurse Corps, so she could get the, the monthly check and help me in college and help my um, mom with some badly needed surgery. 
but um, those were the times, you know, family helping family. Uh, I got along with my aunts after that, you know, so. And then I, I did get married while I was in graduate school at the University of Chicago, and my husband heard this story, and he said, yeah, she married me, and I've enjoyed every penny of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you knew Judge, and <laughs> he would say something like yeah. that. And uh, there were reasons he would say that, because he got interested. <laughs> He got interested in aviation along the way, and you know, that's not a cheap hobby. Mm -hmm. But we, we had a lot of family fun, and um, we were married 52 and a half years, lots of laughs, and wow. uh, with his uh, wow. wisecracking. But uh, while in college at, the uni at Clark, each summer I traveled to upstate New York, worked as a live-in maid uh, during uh, the summer months, and then uh, I traveled that segregated train that's now on display at the African uh, American Museum in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. You rode that train. I rode that train, mm -hmm. yes. It was segregated. And I, I remember I was in the colored car, as mm -hmm. they were called. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of this is displayed in the transportation exhibits mm -hmm. for that museum. But I was seated in the colored car. I remember clearly when the conductor would walk through the car after we crossed the Mason-Dixon line and say, now you, you people can move to the front, <laughs> to the <laughs> other cars. Nobody moved. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was something else I remembered about that train, that train car. The whole car smelled like fried chicken. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because <laughs> that's, you know, that was, the, that was the food of choice that's for blacks when we traveled mm -hmm. because we couldn't stop mm -hmm. in restaurants and, you know, we had that segregated seating yeah. all yeah. along. Yeah. But um, I got that work through my dean of women at Clark, uh, Phoebe Burney, and people of my generation know, know mm -hmm. Phoebe Burney. Mm -hmm. She was the dean of women. Uh, she uh, asked my mother if I could go and take one of these jobs, um, a group of... Uh, generous, wealthy, and good-natured um, white women mm -hmm. wanted to do something to help mm -hmm. us black people in the South. So they put together this little initiative mm -hmm. to offer us jobs. And um, I went to uh, Pauling, New York uh, in about the end of May uh, each year and returned home in September, having saved every penny I earned, all $25 per week uh, <laughs> as the live-in maid, and uh, because Mrs. Dan, the first lady I worked for, was very good to me, she, mm -hmm. I didn't have to spend, I went sightseeing in the city each week mm -hmm. on my Thursday off. At, at no cost to you. No cost to me. <laughs> she would help me plan my sightseeing trip. I would get on the train, uh, go into Grand Central mm -hmm. Station. Mm -hmm. Now, the train from South Georgia came into Penn Station mm -hmm. in New York City, Pennsylvania. So I got to learn all of these names before I got to graduate school at the University of Chicago. But I visited uh, the Empire State Building, all the sites, mm -hmm. Rockefeller uh, Center, mm -hmm. Rockefeller Plaza, and um, she would, this is something that really impressed me about Mrs. Dan. She, she told me about all the fancy stores along um, Fifth Avenue, uh, Bloomingdale's, Saks Fifth Avenue, the others. She said, and if you want to buy something, here's my credit cards. I'm going to give you my credit cards. Mm -hmm. She trusted me, and, and that meant a lot to me. Uh, so I uh, we got on, but by the time I got to the University of Chicago, having uh, been sightseeing in New York City each of those four summers, I was sort of, uh, I was familiar with the uh, sophistication of the big city. Uh, however, I lived on campus all four years at the University of Chicago while I was studying for a doctorate degree. So that's enough about my journey. It's a long journey, I tell you, but <laughs> so I, I will stop there. Well, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. As you emerged uh, to become uh, a person that would introduce herself as a scientist, mm -hmm. when did you say, I am a scientist? Um, by the time I got to the... Uh, National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C. I, I did not have to apologize for being a woman scientist because I was uh, capable, I was smart, and I was accomplished as a scientist. And I was attending uh, colloquia 
uh, in my special my specialty, which was uh, calorimetry, and that's an energy field. I was I, I did my doctorate in physical chemistry. I was a recognized expert then. Mm -hmm. I had published some papers with my research advisor, so I was more expert than those people who had to who who might have shunned me. Mm -hmm. I had some something that they didn't have. I had some information they wanted. So I didn't have to apologize anymore for being a woman uh, to scientists. But uh, still, on the outside world, uh, people thought it was unbecoming <laughs> of a woman to have all these degrees. And so I, I had to uh, make that becoming along the way. But uh, I've always been studious to a fault, so I didn't, I didn't have any difficulty staying quiet. You know, I didn't need to boast. I just had, I had the satisfaction of excellence, that was important to me, and um, I worked at uh, people at the National Bureau of Standards, which is a superb uh, government agency in Washington. It keeps the standards of measurements for the company, the country. Uh, while Judge was in uh, graduate school at Howard. So I didn't, I got to the point where I didn't have to be a warm, I didn't have to uh, be uh, embarrassed in, into withholding information from people because I was a woman, mm -hmm. because I was accomplished. And uh, the other thing that helped me along the way was having attend, in that regard, having attended uh, some quality places and taken advantage of the learning there uh, oh, during my early journey. First, Clark College in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the people there cared about us. They cared about us students and they encouraged us students and that was a confidence builder. I got to the uh, University of Chicago, uh, just a superb institution. They felt that they were better than all other institutions, mm -hmm. Harvard included, by yes, the way. Yes. And uh, otherwise, you better not tell them they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> that it is a superb scholarly place. So I, I, that was a confidence builder. So then you got to the, University, to the National Bureau of Standards, another superb place. Uh, and that was uh, having that experience under my belt was also a confidence, a confidence builder. And uh, because I was studious by nature, as some people would say, a bookworm, in a way, uh, I got a lot of satisfaction from those affiliations, those associations, and uh, that foundation. I did, though, when I uh, was choosing the University of Chicago for graduate study, I considered the University of Minnesota, not knowing <laughs> that Minnesota was in my future one day. Uh, and I'll tell you how that happened. While uh, in graduate school in physical chemistry, we used a book, a textbook. Uh, no, that was in, in Atlanta, while at Clark. We used a textbook in physical chemistry by uh, Farrington and Daniels. They were faculty members at the University of Minnesota. So that's how I got to know the name, the, the University of Minnesota. Uh, but the factor in choosing the University of Chicago was that I, uh, my chemistry professor for physical chemistry, who was also a Morehouse uh, faculty member, had attended the University of Chicago, and he was good. And uh, the president, Benjamin Mays, Dr. Benjamin Mays, had, had attended the University of Chicago. He was good. There was another faculty member at Clark uh, the uh, head of the social sciences department who had attended the University of Chicago. So I looked around and I said, these are great people. I want to go where they went. They pointed you in the direction. <laughs> yeah, that's how, I, that's, that was the key factor mm -hmm. in my choosing the University mm -hmm. of Chicago. But another very important factor was mm -hmm. I, I was awarded a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship mm -hmm. uh, to pay all of my expenses at uh, the, uh, the first year of graduate school and also, they gave me, they had money left over or something. Uh, no, it was another, I got another fellowship from the National Medical Association, mm -hmm. and then they gave me the funds for a second year of graduate school. So I did not have nearly the hardship funding my education, graduate studies, I did uh, uh, for uh, undergrad. undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And um, 
But um, I must say, the president at the time of Clark College was determined to help me. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't say enough of those. Mm -hmm. And you, naturally, there were prejudices against women. Mm -hmm. I, I had two barriers to fight, the, the sexism and the um, uh, being African-American, being a black, mm -hmm. black American. Uh, uh, we could uh, bow to sexism. That was not unique to us. It was unique to um, white women as well. Mm -hmm. It was a gender bias, we call it now. Uh, I, I could ignore that uh, because I was smarter than they were. <laughs> I, I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I made, I set the curve on the exams, you know what that means. <laughs> and uh, we laugh about it. I still laugh about it with my generation, the Morehouse people, because we took courses together and um, they would tease my husband. You married that chick and she set the curve in that physics course? And so we laughed about that. And, uh, but uh, those, were, those were fun days. But uh, Dr. Mays married my husband and me mm -hmm. on the, all Morehouse campus uh, along the way. So. We made peace with each other. That's great. I'll, I'll stop there because well, it's, no, a, it's a wonderful. long story. And I knew Dr. Mays. I went to Morehouse for my freshman year. You know oh, that. You you know, oh, so I'm yes. familiar with the campus mm -hmm. and the community. Mm -hmm. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with uh -huh. Al McFarland. A great story <laughs> from Dr. Retha Clark King. She mm -hmm. served as president of General Mills Foundation. She mm -hmm. was president of Metropolitan State University. She's a scientist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to learn more about the impact you've been able to have in building community. When we come back, I'm gonna bring in uh, my other guest at the table, uh, Sister Atum Azahir, and uh, she's also a community builder. Yes, and I'm yes. interested in the interplay, the uh, engagement of uh, how you and I have entered this world uh, following Dr. King and how mm -hmm. she's affected your life and my life. And we'll bring one more voice to the table. That is Diana Hawkins, uh, who is executive director of Hawthorne Neighborhood Council, former executive with Time Warner Cable, and a friend for all of us at the table here. Mm -hmm. So we'll be back in a second with more conversations with Al McFarland. Wayne, what do you think? The world is now. What are we waiting for? The world is now, what are we all waiting for? Hey you, you are the witness. Come down and tell you the truth. One foot on the platform. One more looking at you. Now, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The world is now. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? And you see, every day we must get on our knees and pray. All it round the human race we must learn to live. Dr. King, she said it to me this very morning. Watch how you have to be, you gotta be better than them. I remember the words and I'll carry them with me the rest of this time. Dr. King, she said it, she's on my mind. The world is now, what are we wait? See, and you did not wait. You went on and went to school, did your thing. What are you waiting for? They was trying to hold you back, but she said. The world is now, 1954. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank.
I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. Great conversation with Dr. Aretha Clark King, uh, as we indicated, president of General Mills Foundation, a vice president of that great Minnesota company, General Mills. Her story, a fascinating story. Uh, off camera, we were saying it might take about 10 more days uh, to get for the next part of her story, and we're going to figure out how to make that happen. But I want to bring uh, two other great voices into the conversation. I introduced you earlier to Atum Azahir. She's Chief Executive Officer and Chief Compliance Officer. She's founder and the Elder Consultant in African Ways of Knowing at the Cultural Wellness Center. Now, the Cultural Wellness Center is an iconic, uh, groundbreaking organization in South Minneapolis, actually in Twin Cities and in Minnesota. And uh, Atum Azahir has uh, built a reputation of service, of leadership, of uh, connectivity. And I, I want to sort of uh, ask you, uh, uh, Atum Asa here to talk about what it means when you say African ways of knowing and put that in the context of this great testimony we've heard this morning. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Al. I said to you yesterday that I, um, I feel honored mm -hmm. to be here both with you, uh, but also with Dr. King because um, she really was influential uh, early on when I uh, came to Minnesota, one of the uh, places that I first uh, kind of got my wings mm -hmm. was at the Harriet Tubman Women's Shelter. Mm -hmm. I was uh, um, recruited uh, kind of, uh, which was in itself great, mm -hmm. <laughs> but to be the um, executive director and then turned turn out that I was the longest reigning executive director for this shelter that had been opened um, in about 1976, uh, and then 1978, uh, I came here, and then 80 became the executive director. Uh, and as, that's where I met Dr. King, was uh, as I traveled around doing speaking engagements, um, I met you, and the uh, number of executives, people, you know, who were not used to hearing uh, about uh, this idea of our community uh, actually struggling and surviving and all of the stories of resiliency that I um, learned how to uh, articulate was what we were talking about. And so Dr. King, after a presentation, just looked at me and pointed her finger and said to me, you're going to go places. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that. So when you... Um, told me that I was going to be on a panel with her. I wanted to say I'm glad I can come and tell her where I've gone and uh, how great uh, it is to be here with you. So thank you. Thank you so much for your thank story. You. Um, African ways of knowing. Um, I am a product of the Delta in Mississippi. Um, and uh, the people of Mississippi, uh, um, in the part where I grew up, were the brutal, uh, the brutal uh, beatdown on a physical as well as intellectual and spiritual level was, um, I think, unprecedented, even in terms of the uh, experience that we have had in this country, having been enslaved in all you know ways. But there is something that happened in the Delta that, um, even to this day, you know, that's where the blues was born. And uh, many of those experiences really, I think, almost got hidden by the fact that the people were so resilient. Uh, my father and mother, you know, who um, didn't go the path of the formal education and the formal academy or the formal institutions, they were, uh, for the most part, relegated to what at that point in time was the other side of the track, with, even within our own uh, African experience. My mother and father were not allowed to go to school. That did not relegate them to being stupid, however, or, or, or being unable to take care of themselves, or being dependent on uh, the European systems that were in place. Um, they were not, uh, I can remember distinctly, my mother refusing uh, 
uh, once the Jim Crow laws started to relax a little bit and go underground as opposed to being so visible. I can remember my mother refusing to work um, for the European women because of the fact that their husbands waited until the woman left and really it was really a fertile ground for being raped and all of those things. And I remember my mother refusing to work for that reason and getting a reputation actually for being crazy because she not only refused to work but she also carried a pistol mm -hmm. and really uh, in many, many situations uh, were able to uh, um, just able to make it, you know, just by by the by the by her by her own scraping of different growing vegetables and all the different kinds of things that she had to do for herself to make it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember as a little girl, as a matter of fact, um, learning the learning to read, learning the alphabet and all of that, and then being the one. As many people tell the story now, I was the one, you know, who read letters for her and spelled things and, and helped uh, from that point of view. So this intellectual development intrigued me then and continued to intrigue me. How could people like my mother and father still have joy? What, what, what gave them this capacity to, in the case of my mother, you know, be a, a, a brilliant woman? Uh, but couldn't read or write uh, the English language. Um, her reading, however, was not of the language that was the, the, the controlling language. It was reading people. Mm -hmm. It was reading the dynamics. It was reading all the ways, you know, that you had to read to protect yourself. The invisible dynamics is what I now know my mother and father read uh, to survive. Um, and so I was so intrigued by that, Al, that I tried to find what that was. And as I've grown and as I um, uh, moved uh, to a place where I could then start to study, my study was not, uh, once again, it wasn't as formal in terms of the academic study. My study was to study black people. What did we think? What did we know? What was our history? Uh, and as I started to get the history, I started to see that what my mother and father and other black people in this area, including the blues and the gospel singers and all of those, that was indeed an intellectual heritage that came with us and that survived, you know, the slave trade, that survived, you know, the Jim Crow system, that survived the negligence and the capacity uh, that Europeans had, you know, to keep our people from learning to read, write, and do all those things. What I learned is that those were our innate, natural, uh, original uh, uh, ways, and that those ways had a name. And what I learned is that as we trace ourselves beyond and before the slave trade, what I understood and what I understand now is that our ways of knowing and ways of being have to be uh, both articulated, written about, and also taught to us again. Because one of the impacts of the slave trade, one of the impacts of the capping of our intelligence, and one of the impacts of keeping us from thinking for ourselves and, and doing for ourselves, one of the impacts is that we now don't think that we know anything. So those things that we knew and the things that we survived using, whether it was foods and turning foods and turning the scraps that were given to us into something that was amazing. The capacity that we have for that comes from our capacity to know. Uh, and, and so this knowing of spirituality, knowing that it is in the spirit, that it is in uh, the connection that we have with the creator, our people, uh, Dr. King, as you know, and uh, as you all know, our people love God, right? Okay. And mm -hmm. so this idea yeah, that we love God gave me mm -hmm. a, um, a pursuit of, well, what does that really mean, you know, if it isn't um, what is kind of formal, then what does it really mean? The love and what of God I, is real. The love of it's, God. It's not an academic expression. It's not, mm -hmm. and it's not an institutional expression. Mm -hmm. In the African, mm -hmm. it is how we know to be grateful when we get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's how we know that the sun 
-hmm. is connected to us, that the sun shining, that the rising of the sun is connected to our rising in the morning. So African ways of knowing uh, has played out in our lives through this experience and I think live with us today and is now really coming back as a, a way we have to learn again. And so, and so therefore, it's foundational in the work that you do yes. in the Cultural Wellness Center. Talk about that. How, how have you codified and organized and then implemented uh, a system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of engagement uh, that reflects this mm -hmm. system of learning and knowing? Sure. Well, first, I think uh, to, to uh, Dr. King was talking about your and her commitment to our people. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't say it in the same words I'm using, mm -hmm. but you have a dedication to blackness and to black people, and it has never gone anyplace. So, you know, sometimes they call us race people when we're <laughs> the generation, your generation, we're mm -hmm. race people, which means that no matter how far I go and how high I go, I'm going to stay connected to my people and be proud of being black, not be ashamed of it. Well, that to me, is once again, I would say to you, a theory that is a theoretical as well as a philosophical uh, practice that we have. My drive then became to institutionalize that. So there is no institution, and I said there was no institution whose responsibility and vision it was to restore the Africans' capacity to be uh, okay with ourselves and so or to be in community the greatest wealth that we have the greatest asset that we have is community so being a race people means that I am with you because I'm black and that then means that we can be coherent and cohesive again um, and we must be and in my mind it has to be institutionalized so our institution the Cultural Wellness Center, mm -hmm. is that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, we do everything we can to create intersections and interactions between us, no matter where we were born on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of interaction with people from the Caribbean, people from who were born on the continent, many people who come uh, from different parts of the U.S., uh, people who are in different uh, political, ideological places, different religions. And what you do at the Cultural Wellness Center is you know that the psychological space there frees you. So there, it's freeing for you to be black. And what we do is to do as many ceremonies, as many classes, as many connections that we can make to restoring uh, once again, our community, because it's, once again, I would say it's the greatest asset that we have. Uh, I'll, I'll take a big leap here and say that your, your work is almost pre-Wakandian. Oh, Wakanda, that's <laughs> right. right. Uh, because you know, one of the young people <laughs> called me who had just seen the film mm -hmm. uh -huh. and talked to me about the fact that we pay so much attention for it, so much attention to image development, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. We work a lot for us to think about how do we reclaim image mm -hmm. and value image mm -hmm. to such a degree that it is an asset. So how do we, as our people, begin to think of all the kind of economic mm -hmm. uh, as well as intellectual and spiritual um, asset there is uh, in this blackness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she was saying, just, just watching the masks, because if you come to the Cultural Wellness Center, you know you see masks from all over the African world. Sure. You're always going back to ancient Egypt mm -hmm. uh, and all those things. So people come to the center, that's the experience they have. So I like so that. So I'm, I'm loving this conversation because mm -hmm. uh, with Dr. King's story and with your analysis, your uh, sort of uh, exploring African identity, uh, it moves us to understanding the importance and the value of identity. And that moves us to understanding who we truly are because you have always known, uh, dear scientist, Dr. King, yes. that you were smart, mm -hmm. you know, that you were capable, 
and that you would set the curve, right? Mm -hmm. You've known that, but the question is whether our society would accept or allow and how much our society, our culture, would attempt to destroy, diminish, marginalize the gift mm -hmm. that you bring to humanity. And so the question is how do we as a culture both identify and accept, uh, encourage ourselves to know this is African knowing mm -hmm. the truth yep. of who we are. And I think we're at that point. Well, Diana Hawkins, you and I go back mm -hmm. a long ways because you're responsible uh, in many ways for this program. Uh, your leadership as an executive at Time Warner Cable mm -hmm. uh, was one of the reasons that we got funding to start the predecessor to this program when we launched the Insight KMLJ Public Policy Forum at Lucille's Kitchen. Yes. Yeah. A, great, a great program, a great yeah. run. Yeah. And so you've been at the front of engaging assets and community, connecting those with resources. And you did the same thing, Dr. King. You funded the program as well from General Mills Foundation. So I thank mm -hmm. both of you. Uh, you also have this great connection with Dr. King because she's been uh, the driving force behind the Hawthorne Huddle. Yes. Talk about that because you recently celebrated her uh, 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 history. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, well, first of all, I have to say just like you, thank you to Dr. King because she was one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. And when I first came here and I met her, Gio, you know, so many years ago, um, it was, she did the same thing to me. She looked at me and she said, yeah, I want to talk to you. That's right. And that was history, okay? Yeah. That was real history yeah. because here's the lady who saw something in me and she guided me. So thank you again. I, I have to, every time I see her, I have to thank her because I wouldn't be the businesswoman that I am today had it not been for her, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, so going back, we celebrated 20 years in December of the Hawthorne Huddle at General, General, with General Mills at the helm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. King was very instrumental in that. Mm -hmm. She did things that you would have not believed. This mm -hmm. woman was up tireless nights mm -hmm. getting work done. Mm -hmm. She was at the city getting work done. Mm -hmm. She was in your face getting work done. Mm -hmm. But she believed in the community. Mm -hmm. She believed in the Hawthorne community. Mm -hmm. And so her work speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. You and I, Al, we did Time to Read, Mm -hmm. We've been mentors. Mm -hmm. We've been dealing in the schools. The community is my life. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And I come from a community-oriented family. Mm -hmm. I come from a mixed family. So I had to learn. Mm -hmm. I had to learn what it was and how to act mm -hmm. and how I act this way and how I act that way. But I did. And to have, to come to Minnesota and to have mentors <coughs> that I did. I had six mentors when I first came here. Mm -hmm. And they picked me up. So that's how I got to where I am today. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in examining and sort of uh, asking you all to reflect on the role and the power of black women, of women in general, black women in particular. I think that from within our community, we fail, uh, the community at large, but black men fail to fully appreciate and celebrate the strength and the power. We know it's there, but we are uh, conditioned to deny the truth and the wisdom that exists through our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, our wives, our friends. And so somehow, I think we're moving towards a place where we have to understand that for us to be us, we have to recognize that we are each other and that there's no limit that any one of us can bring, but there is unlimitedness mm -hmm. uh, in our capacity in our community, but we have to acknowledge that. What do you think, Dr. King? Um, I think you're you're right in that respect, Al. But let me let me back up just a minute mm -hmm. and get one word out of your vocabulary, please. please. Uh, I'll uh, be being, instructed. Being the elder around the table, I can I can do that. Um, I want to I want to get the word failure out mm -hmm. of your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I would agree. Yes, you learn uh, from experience. Mm -hmm. You learn from by looking back, but you learn more by looking ahead. Mm -hmm. So failure, uh, a failure, your thought about failure means that there's another opportunity. So let's think opportunity. Uh, we, um, I think, have to take a look at the word family. Uh, you know, my husband and I had a strong family, and you know, we brought that from him from Birmingham and. Uh, my, my side from Georgia, uh, we grew up in strong families where family members helped each other. 
And uh, so we learn by example there. And I think uh, we, we want to encourage that amongst our people, strong family. Um, when mother and father are separated, they still have a bond in their children. So we want to encourage that. And then I see one institution for doing that is through the church, uh, through our uh, churches and uh, advocating family because there are a lot of resources in family. Family help you get along. So um, I, if a person no. feels they have failed once, they don't have to fail twice. Right. <laughs> That's right. the thing. Um, I um, am an advocate for our black men, um, for uh, young men, as well as older men, uh, and for just helping people in need. And uh, for my feminist friends, you know, I, I spoke at length about uh, gender bias. There is that gender bias, but uh, I do speak openly uh, about uh, being supportive of the efforts and supports for black men because of the biases and discrimination and hate that's been directed toward them by society over so many years. And we saw that growing up in the Deltas and in South Georgia. Uh, uh, my generation saw the era, lived in an era where if um, a young black fellow says something unbecoming of him in the eyes of the power to be, uh, there would be a house to house hunt when that got reported and people would search your home and pull him out and take him downtown. And um, I could hear my mother say, uh, oh, Miss, Miss So-and-So's son was taken out last night. I hope they didn't beat him up. Mm -hmm. And surely he would be beaten up. Mm -hmm. So we well, experienced yeah. those times mm -hmm. of our uh, shame mm -hmm. and hate directed toward black men. So I, I correct my uh, feminist friends that I'm not anti-women <laughs> when I speak up saying uh, we have to bring the whole community along. They understand what I mean. Uh, so it's a it's a day-to-day -day, uh, struggle requiring lots of commitment. So I would ask the question of all of us, do we have the commitment uh, to keep trying, to keep trying, and to keep making our communities stronger? Now, I, uh, after I came back from seeing Black Panther, I got off the elevator in my building, my uh, uptown, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, upscale uh, condo building, with all kinds of jewelry on. <laughs> and I said, they're very proud of it. And I told my friends on the elevator, you're going to see more of this from me. <laughs> that's, that's the influence that that uh, movie has had on me, uh, to, to pull out that jewelry, be proud of it. Yeah. Now, but growing up, my, my generation in the South uh, presented some uh, barriers to black pride. We were told mm -hmm. if you were black, you were ugly. Mm -hmm. and, and too many of us bleached our skin mm -hmm. to make it lighter. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, working against what you were, uh, what you were advocating in the wellness center. That's correct. Because you have to had to unlearn this notion mm -hmm. right. that you were ugly, your lips were thick, right? And uh, and that was uh, and I, I suppose when we got off the slave ship, that's these are the notions that were indoctrinated in us, mm -hmm. and but you were inferior. Mm -hmm. So that's correct. now I'm not going to uh, be angry about it. Mm -hmm. I'm just That's not right. going to believe it. And uh, some people, though, believe that uh, uh, more than others. So we've had to unlearn That's the right. uh, impact right. of that kind of uh, 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 that unfairness that was directed to us. Yes. Uh, but um, I, I just, uh, however, now let me give you this side of the story. Mm -hmm. When I became president of Metropolitan State University mm -hmm. in 1977, I couldn't come to the faculty and the student body and say, I'm a president just for black people. Right. Yes. Uh, right. That would have been dishonest. Right. And gee whiz, my grandmother would have turned over in her grave <laughs> had not been honest. Yes. So I couldn't, the, the legislature and my board couldn't see me yes. as uh, wanting to be a president. I had to be a, the best president I could be yeah. for all of the public. But that's, that's the lesson of the day, isn't it, Atum? Mm -hmm. well, the leadership think, we're talking about is. is leadership for humanity. Mm -hmm. I think it is, and, uh, and I do want to, mm -hmm. to acknowledge, uh, mm -hmm. though, that uh, really and truly this idea, I agree with you completely about uh -huh. failure, uh -huh. is that to, uh, to destroy a people, mm -hmm. one of the first approaches is to uh, impact the women. 
And mm -hmm. so the women of our community were indeed, it isn't our men who mm -hmm. started to uh, destabilize us and to disrespect mm -hmm. us. It started with the enslavement of our people. So mm -hmm. I just want to really make sure that mm -hmm. we go there and that we then have to study what was the original state of womanhood and manhood exactly. uh, as we think about ourselves as African people and we have to bring that back. That is not going to happen in the Me Too movement and it's not going to, in the Me Too movement, you know, on the dark side of the street is a book that talks about the level of rape that happened within the African community mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the fact that we carry that forward, whether it's in our relationships with our men uh, or in the relationships we have with our children, all of those things are a part of this mm -hmm. enslavement mm -hmm. and a part of the destabilization of our people. So the disconnection of us from our own spiritual, cultural, and intellectual heritage that begins with spirituality in with harmony is not a part of the European system. So we have to, I agree with you, not be angry, mm -hmm. but be incensed by the fact that our intelligence has been capped yep. and our spirituality has been redefined mm -hmm. and that that is the places mm -hmm. now where we can go and uh, the film is one thing that gave us the mm -hmm. permission, but we have to give ourselves permission because even in the film, you know, once again, it starts us to think about, well, who has the, who is, has the authority to really define us? Mm -hmm. Well, it's gonna come from us, from elders like you, mm -hmm. from women and men like you. That's where it's going to come from. So, one final thing, you know, I have four sons mm -hmm. and, um, I, there is no way my four sons, my brother, my father, uh, were with me, you know, mm -hmm. as I have become who I am. Mm -hmm. And there is no way for us to think about a separation. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the ancestors made sure that I had four sons so that I could understand manhood. Mm -hmm. I could understand through manhood how womanhood gets the chance, you know, to be once again what it is on the planet. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what, what we, I think, as, as black women have mm -hmm. to rethink and rearticulate uh, as we build our own movements. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful conversation. I think mm -hmm. we said it all today. We'll, do, <laughs> we'll do this again. I am so pleased to have had all of you in this conversation. Dr. Aretha Clark King, uh, Atum Azahir, and Diana Hawkins, thank you all for leadership, for mm -hmm. service. Uh, I'm just so uh, impressed uh, with your impeccable approach to the notion and the power of being humble. Uh, it's amazing. I've watched you, and you are phenomenal. So thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. Join us again next time. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm Al McFarland. Master one more time. Going down to Mississippi. Go and play the blues one more time. Well, if I had my way. this building down Well if I had my way I would burn this here building down Talk to me babe Make me feel good all night. I went down to the crossroad. Just to see my brother there. Went down to the crossroad. See my brother there. Would nobody?
somebody let me do what I want to do. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. I'm just a cowboy. I'm going to come into your town. Every time I see you, you make my heart go wild. Every time you kiss me, you make me want to smile. It's all right. It's okay. I want to be that special lover today. I want to be your cowboy, please.